to Live from the Ranch. My name is Ken Ramirez, and I'd like to say good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from today. Um, our co-host today, like every single month, is uh, Juliana DeWillems. Juliana is with uh, JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Juliana, how are you doing today? I know she's out there somewhere. Here she is. How are you? I'm great, Ken. How are you? How are your holidays? It's hard to believe it's already 2024 and the, hol the holidays just happened. <laughs> I know. It, it, first of all, it was, been a, it was a great holiday for me. I stayed home and got a lot of things done, and that always makes me feel productive. But it is hard to believe that it's 2024, um, especially when I think about the fact that the Live from the Ranch broadcasts started in 2020 as a response to the COVID uh uh, epidemic pandemic that happened and we and we are now in our fourth year of doing live from the ranch and I'm so glad that you have been able to be a, a co-host with me I think you've been a part of every broadcast except for the very first one it was I think it was that first one where I felt overwhelmed and said oh my goodness I need a co-host <laughs> I know it's crazy it's been so long I will say the behaviors that come with hosting and co-hosting have become quite fluent with all of this practice so that's yeah. one nice part of the longevity yeah that's true and we've had we've been good had the good fortune on live from the ranch to have a wide variety of guests and this week we is, is this month is no different we've got two guests joining us today and they're from uh underdog animal rescue and rehab and my first guest today her name is uh anna ritchie and she is the development and fundraising director for underdog animal rescue and rehab based out of mohab utah and they are the uh only dog rescue in the state that exclusively serves the Four Corners Native American Reservation region and the 500,000 stray and unwanted pets that live there. They do this through free and low-cost low spay, neuter, and vaccine clinics, and of course through the rescue efforts that they do there as well. Anna began their career uh, at Underdog in May of 2022 after graduating from college in West Virginia with a bachelor's degree in English. And in college, they focused mainly on nonprofit relations and on literature. And their first position with Underdog was as an animal care and transfer coordinator. And in their time, uh, Anna, as an animal care employee, adopted out and transferred over 200 dogs. And after several months in animal care, they were promoted to their current position, where they handle all of the development and individual fundraising for Underdog, as well as run all of their social media accounts. Uh, I'd like to welcome Anna Ritchie to the program. Hi, Anna, how are you doing today? I'm so glad that you could join us and I'm sure we'll get you on the screen. There she is. Hi, Anna, how are you? Hi, I'm great, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm so glad that you could join us and I'm glad that uh, we could have uh, another one of your uh, co-workers there join us in just a little bit and find out a little bit more about some of the the, the work you're doing there. Um, how did you first get involved in Underdog Rescue? How did you find out about it and, and what drew you to them? Um, well, I actually found Underdog through social media. Um, and whenever I checked out our website, um, what drew me was the statistics. So I am from West Virginia. The Four Corners Reservation area is about the size of West Virginia. Um, and the statistics told me, you know, there are only two vets that service that entire area. That is the size of my home state where we have 700 plus vets. Um, so that was kind of startling for me. Um, it was kind of a crazy number to think about. Um, but I started researching more and more and I found out, you know, 40% of residents that live on the reservations live below the national pover poverty line. Um, where the national average is 11 and a half percent and they're at 40. So it's kind of an area of extreme need. Um, and only 40% of the residents there have electricity or running water. Um, and it's also a food desert. So it was kind of shocking to find out that there's an estimated population of 500,000, um, pet type animals like cats and dogs that are in need of help in this area. Yeah. Um, and that's what that's what hooked me in. I knew that I had to help once I heard that. I, I agree. I, I as I started learning more about your organization and hearing about all that uh, that that you guys do, uh, I was drawn into it myself. Just 
watching videos and learning as much as I could about what you what what you're doing there. Tell us a little bit more about the mission. Is um, is every does under underdog do more outside of the reservations or is it entirely working with the various reservation communities there in the four corners area? We exclusively work with the native American communities on the res. So, um, we're the only, uh, dog rescue in the state of Utah, as you said, that exclusively works with reservations. The only dogs that we take in are from the four corners, native American reservation area. Um, we don't take in dogs outside of that. So um, we host our spay and neuter clinics there and we do treat dogs and cats, um, but we only ex we only serve those populations exclusively. And do you have a, a volunteers and workers that that come from the uh, the the reservations? Do you have a lot of the uh, Native American individuals uh, uh, doing part of the work and participating in in, in your organization? Um, we definitely have a fantastic relationship with the communities that we serve, which is super wonderful and amazing. Um, we actually see a lot of our volunteers driving from very far away to come be a part of our clinics. Um, and we work with these communities to host these clinics at chapter houses or local community buildings. And they help us spread the we will be there to provide these services. And I, I think for a lot of our viewers, there may be some questions as to how does a rescue that serves the, the, the reservation communities differ from, let's say, a big city uh, uh, rescue organization? Uh, is there a big difference or are they very similar in their missions and the way they operate? I would say that we are very different. Um, so we do not have like when you think of a county or a city facility, you think of like a cinder block building, you know, with um, like tiny little concrete runs. Um, we do not do that. All of our dogs are housed in outdoor runs um, where they have like two to three dogs in that large run where they have plenty of space to romp around and play. And with the populations that we serve, it's actually kind of a shock. Um, lots of these dogs have never been in a home. So for us to take them from, you know, where they have all of the freedom in the world living outside um, and put them into a small kennel like that, it would just be super detrimental for their mental health um, and for like how they interact with us. Well, so that's fascinating. That's a, that, that makes sense that there would be a big difference in what those dogs were used to and what they've expo experienced before. And and when I saw the number 500,000 strays and rescues, uh, is that a, on an annual basis or uh, is there, what, what, what does that number, in what time frame are we looking at when we talk about 500,000 strays in that area? That is just the estimated number. So it used to be 250,000. It's actually impossible to get an exact read because a lot of these dogs are free, free roaming. Um, Culturally, dogs aren't like really kept on leashes or in fences. That, that's just a cultural thing um, with the Native American communities. Their dogs have been community dogs. They roam around um, and they don't usually have a lot of issues with that. Um, but with things like not being able to afford fencing um, and these dogs like running around like at gas stations, trying to get food from different sources. A lot of the dogs that we've seen have been like hit by cars, things like that. Um, so it's not like the best situation for the dogs, but it's kind of um, culturally what they've grown up in. No, I'm very familiar with that. I I, I grew up for many years in New Mexico, uh, very, right, right near the Mescalero Reservation. And it isn't just the reservation dogs that are handled that way. Often many of the animals that live in those rural ranch-like communities are not on leashes, are not fenced in they really have a free roam of 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 their space and it it actually gave me a a misperception of what life in the big city would be like because i had always been around dogs that lived outside that roamed around outside that barked whenever they wanted and didn't really bother anybody could chase rabbits if they wanted and didn't really anybody care uh could pee and poop wherever they wanted because they were outdoors so the first time i moved into a city situation i was going oh my goodness these dogs 
deal with a very different world than the dogs where I grew up in. And so uh, I, I can really relate to what you're talking about because that's kind of the kind of community that I grew up in myself. Yeah. Um, and I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, a lot of people drive through the res for the first time and they see dogs, you know, wandering around. And the thing is, is if you stop station on the res, you're probably going to be see like four or five, six dogs, but they're not always not owned dogs. They're very clever. Right. And so they're there to um, manipulate humans for food. Um, so you should always ask um, the gas station clerks, is this somebody's dog or has this guy been hanging around here for a while? <laughs> right. That's interesting. You know, one of the things I thought would be good to do before we go to our first break is I wondered if it would be okay if I shared a video from, uh, you turned me on to a, a, a YouTube channel by a, a, a young woman named Maria of Roaming Reckless. And she apparently, she and some of her friends spent like four days volunteering uh, with you at Underdog uh, rescue and rehab. And she posted these 30 minute daily blogs about what she did there. And I, I got to tell you, I got hooked in and watched all four episodes, which was like two hours of, of, of video, but it was fascinating. And, and it really kind of shows some of the work that you do. And on day three, I think she visited one of the clinics that you do on the reservation. And if it's okay, well, why don't we go watch that video and then we'll go to a commercial break. And then when we come back, um, I'll, I'll bring Cameron on and then we'll talk to the two of you about the clinics and about the training and about other things that go on uh, with underdog rescue and rehab. So let's go to that video and uh, we'll talk to you on the other side of the video. Okay, Anna? Yeah, sounds good. All right, good two videos you guys saw us get educated on why there's 500,000 strays in the Four Corners area. You also saw us go to the reservation, save starving puppies, and much more. In today's video, you guys are going to see us join Underdog Rescue while they host a vaccination clinic for families in the Navajo Nation and surrounding reservations. My friends Nick and Cena are with me to help volunteer. Um, is this it right here? This is uh -huh. the or is it that building? See the, um, the... The dog bus? How's it going? We're here about nine and there's already a line. Getting started. It's going really well so far. It's just busy. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're coming. Yeah, where can everybody help? We will need another person doing paperwork. I'll do it. Right, you're on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is our, um, vaccine form. Harbo Distemper, um, the rabies vaccine. So basically they fill this out and now you're just... Dogs that are getting rabies and harbo. Draw it out and put the sticker, whatever we draw out on the syringe. Very nice. Like organized. How many dogs do you usually treat? Um, it depends. I would expect 200 animals. Okay. Okay. But that's what I came prepared for. Awesome. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Look at that head. Get in there. Get in there. Get in there. Well, we don't need dog food. <laughs> <laughs> what are they eating? <laughs> she is so lazy. <laughs> so we have a Harley and a Tonka and we have a diesel. That's so cute. I just have Harley. Good boy, good boy, good boy. One more. Good boy. Good job. Good you guys don't have security issues. <laughs> How do you feel, Nick? Wonderful. <laughs> are you going to administer flea and tick? Yes, I am. And I don't think they're going to have a problem eating it. What are you trying to say? They're just really healthy, happy <laughs> dogs. Go, dude. Go, girl. Good girl. Good girl. Come on. There you go. There you go. Good girl. Good boy. You're going to have to... You're gonna have to... <laughs> Here you go. Oh, oh god. Amber does it. Oh. 
Just send it. Okay. Yeah, sweet tick. If you just put it in there and just... Oh my god! <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. I don't think he'll bite me. He's just gonna be... Yeah. Oh, uh, it's just right there. Oh, he's not letting me. Going in, buddy. Let me see, Tonka. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, dude. Good, Good boy. boy. Good boy. Oh. Be tough. Be tough. Be tough. <laughs> Okay, buddy, ready? I know. Oh, look at you! <laughs> so brave! Is that the special sauce? <laughs> it is. I, I hope they like it because that's even the three of these. What is They're that? Getting... Some kind of ranch. Nice. Intestinal parasites. Intestinal parasites. Cut everything I just said. It's for intestinal parasites. <laughs> what? <laughs> What? Yeah. Apparently. Apparently. Okay, I'm gonna do. And it tastes like cake batter, is what I've heard. Nice. Just do it. Send it. Send it. I'm gonna go with this one. I think this one will take it. <laughs> He's like begging <laughs> for it. Please. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Easier when you hold the top. Hold the top? Yeah, of their shoe. Yeah, of their shoe. Like this? No, 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 no. The, the dog. Oh. Okay. <laughs> We're not all the way in. There you go. Guess how much she weighs. How much? She said 190 last time, right? 190? I'm it's a beautiful surprised. Dog. But the thing is, it's not like a big dog. It's not just like a Yeah, no, but like he's huge. So these are all the ticks after those puppies got, got to the ranch that were already dead. Holy cow. So it's really bad. Yeah, that's nuts. How many think that? How many hundred do you think that is? I mean, per pile, it was like 30. I mean, and then I picked up this little guy too. Cute. Yes. Wow. I love it. Where'd you find him? Um, it was at one of the, yeah, one of the houses. Okay. And I ended up going to like, Three others. Oh, wow. that's a good call. And that's yours. Okay. And you are all set. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Wait, sh show oh, me yeah. your hair. Is that how you store? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's convenient. <laughs> that is yeah. hilarious. It tastes like sugar. That's what I heard. It's like cake batter. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. It's, it's good. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. What a boy. So quick with it. <laughs> Back of the hair. Oh, I love it. That's just a short clip from the videos that were posted on uh, on the uh, Roaming Reckless uh, YouTube channel, and I encourage people to watch some of those videos because it's really fascinating the work that they that that they're doing at. Uh, at Underdog Rescue. Let me just take a, a quick break and share with you all a little bit about KPA, the Karen Pryor Academy's Dog Trainer Professional Program. You know, at Karen Pryor Academy, we try to take an innovative approach to developing and supporting outstanding positive reinforcement trainers. And with KPA, you can build your skills and knowledge by enrolling in an introductory course, or if you already have experience, you can apply to our professional certification program with upcoming workshops in Antwerp, Belgium, in Toronto, Canada, and Columbus, Ohio, here in the US, and many, many other locations throughout 2024. Learn more at karenpryoracademy.com. And now, as we come back, I wanna talk, I wanna introduce you to our second guest who is also with uh, 
underdog rescue. And that is Cameron Bonito. She is the dog behavior and training specialist for underdog rescue. She is certified as an advanced canine training person. So that's C-A-C-T-P. She's a certified training and behavior specialist. That's C-C-T-B-S through the Animal Behavior Institute. She worked for five years at Coco Nino Humane Association in Flagstaff and trained with both shelter dogs there as well as with the public for three years. And since Flagstaff is so close to the Navajo Reservation, she would often receive many reservation dogs in the shelter. And she fell in love with working with semi-feral, unsocialized, and feral dogs. And it was a year ago that she made the transition to working with underdog uh, and dogs from the reservation full time. So Cameron, welcome to Live from the Ranch. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, how are you? And tell us a little bit about uh, how you found out about underdog and got attracted to their work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great story. I actually had never heard of underdog previously. I've always loved working with dogs off of the reservation since I was involved at the shelter in Flagstaff. Um, but I am a part of various training groups on Facebook and um, a woman who happened to be a volunteer at underdog uh, reached out asking for help with a feral dog that she had adopted recently from, I don't think she adopted her at the time when she reached out, but she was working with her at the ranch. And shortly after we started talking, she adopted her. And um, essentially this dog captivated her. And just as a mysterious, um, dark, beautiful dog um, that she has invited into her home, but she couldn't get anywhere near the dog at first. So um, right. I helped her through the process of um, getting near the dog and now they're actually working on collar work and um, she introduced me to underdog uh, as a whole and the rest was history well that's interesting i would imagine that working with underdog you get quite a few potentially under socialized dogs and uh and i was fascinated as i was sharing your bio with everybody you mentioned that you have a passion for working with semi-feral feral or under socialized dogs what is it about dogs that don't have social skills or are not comfortable around people that draws you in? What makes them interesting to you? Um, so these are essentially the dogs that are first to be euthanized in a shelter. Um, so coming mm -hmm. from a, a county shelter who ended up going completely no kill in the remainder of the few years that I was there, um, I got very lucky that I was able to transfer in unsocialized dogs from other shelters and work with them. And um, I started at the shelter very young and met my first unsocialized dog. And um, I started trying various methods and they worked. And so I started taking cases of various severity and it just went from there. And um, it ended up happening where it would take me anywhere from six months to a year to turn around a dog. And um, these were dogs that people in other shelters weren't able to work with at all. And as I said, they would end up being euthanized. And um, it seems I'm just a very patient person and what I was doing worked, so I kept doing it. <laughs> Well, that, that's great. And I'm curious, you know, I, I'm very familiar with shelters all over the United States, and there are some that do have directors of training and behavior, but many shelters don't. And I'm fascinated to see that Underdog Rescue has a position as a person who oversees the training and behavior. Um, is this a position they've always had, or are you the, the first person to fill that role for Underdog? I am the very first person to fill that role for Underdog. And if you could explain to everybody, what would you say as director of, of behavior and training, what, what are your primary responsibilities for, for the organization? Um, so mostly what my day looks like uh, is I try to get hands on every single dog every day. And um, most of the dogs that we deal with have never lived in homes. So they do not understand the basics of living in homes, which includes walking on leash, um, general socialization with people or other animals sometimes um, if they're a little bit more standoffish. But so mostly what I do is leash work and then with more of the unsocialized dogs, getting them used to people and um, adjusting to homes. I'll um, bring them home for an afternoon or take them around town so that they start getting that exposure to people. And maybe I should, uh, uh, I'm going to bring Anna back on in just a minute, but one of the things that she shared with me, which was a surprise to me, was that once you take a dog off of a reservation, 
you're not allowed to adopt them back into the reservation. Is that correct? They, so you really do have to prepare them for life in a different kind of environment than they're used to. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, so because especially recently with that number rising so tremendously, it has been a serious problem um, with spreading diseases with the dogs and they, they would get hit by cars. Um, so once they are off of the reservation, we then have to make sure that they are able to assimilate as pet dogs in regular society. No, that makes that makes lots of sense. I'd love to come back and talk more about training in just a few minutes, but Absolutely. I thought if we could bring Anna back on and maybe we could talk a little bit about the uh, the clinic video that we saw there. I, I was fascinated I, in trying to determine how much of that video to show. I just kept wanting to show more <laughs> yeah. of it because it was just fascinating to see the line of cars and the variety of things that you deal with. How often do you do those clinics in, in, a, in a reservation like that one? Is that once a year, once a month? I mean, I just, I don't have a concept of how often you do them. Um, we we do, our do them every month. Sorry, Anna. Yep, month. Nope, she's exactly right. We do clinics monthly. And uh, and do you do them in the at, at, on the same reservation, or do you serve several different reservations in the Four Corners area? Um, we serve several different communities um, in the Four Corners area, but we try to spread it out as much as possible so that everyone has equal opportunity to receive our services. And and how do how do the uh, the, the people who live in that community find out about the clinics. I guess if they're happening on a monthly basis, they're, they, they know about them, but it would seem to me that a big part of what you need to do is get the communication out so that people know that you're providing that service. Yeah, we mostly use social media, and then we also um, print and pass out flyers at those chapter houses so that information is made available well ahead of time to the people in the communities. Excellent. And Juliana, I wanted to know if you wanted to join in. I noticed there's been a lot of comments coming in on the on the chat window and you've been really paying attention to the chat window. And I wondered if there were any questions for uh, Anna or uh, Cameron that people had that you wanted to share with us or maybe a question that you might have for them. Yes, we do have a few questions from the audience. A reminder to everyone, if you do have questions, please put it in the chat box where you're watching so, so that we can get your questions into the broadcast. And quickly before we get to those, you might have mentioned this already, but how many dogs do you have in the facility? And do they are they all coming in as strays? Are they owner surrenders? What does that look like? Um, it's really varied. Um, we have some owner surrenders, people that reach out to us and they say, like, we can't afford to take care of our pet. Um, could you please take them for us? Um, and then we also have a lot of strays, dogs just reportedly hit by cars that we um, are lucky enough to able to be able to save. Um, we get them from all over the place. But our current statistics are we have 98 dogs in underdogs care. Um, 59 of those dogs are in foster, which we're really proud about, um, especially for our feral and unsocialized dogs. Um, being in a foster home changes their entire life. Um, and then we have 39 dogs at our physical facility at our ranch. Wow. That's very impressive. That's great. <laughs> Any other questions out there, Juliana, that you wanted to ask right now before we go on to the next segment? So this question is uh, from the doghouse rules and they said to Anna, but it can be for both of you. What would you say are the key lessons you have learned from working in this environment, especially the, those that really changed your initial perceptions from when you started? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, I'll go first and then I'll let Cameron answer. But the biggest thing that I learned um, since starting Underdog and working with this population of animals and people is that just because a dog doesn't um, have the same life that your personal pet has, you know, like living inside and, you know, having all of these luxuries, just because a dog doesn't have that doesn't mean that they aren't loved and that they don't have a wonderful life. Absolutely. That's good. That. I appreciate that. How about how about you? For you, Cameron, um, did you have a, a, a answer to that question? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there is a lot of fear 
uh, surrounding dogs, especially free roaming dogs. And so when you provide the tools and you give the education to people, they are eager to work with dogs that they have around them. Um, there's a couple of fosters that we have on the reservations um, where they're holding dogs that we can't quite take in yet or we need to adjust things. So until they are able to come in um, and that I talk to regularly that are eager to work with the puppies and the dogs that are growling at them and that they can't get anywhere near and they're just they want those tools. So when they give those, when I give them those tools or when they are given those tools, um, they are happy to jump into that rather than shying away from the dogs themselves. So, and that helps me tremendously when they come in. That's great. I love that. Um, please continue to put any questions you have for either Cameron or Anna in the chat window, and we'll get to some of those a little bit later on. I kind of wanted to jump from there. One of the questions that came in really asked a question that I was going to ask uh, uh, Cameron myself, and this was a question from uh, Samantha Throttle who asked, "Can Cameron, can you share your process of getting a feral dog on a leash? How do you begin that process? What is the approach you take with a, a dog that has a fear of, of being approached by, by you or anybody else. Absolutely. Um, so when they come to the ranch, uh, we have behavior runs that are smaller um, than our general runs, just because if we allow these dogs to be in the general population, I will never get anywhere near them. <laughs> so they are in smaller runs. Um, they're still bigger than the standard kennel, but essentially I get them used to my presence um, and try to limit the amount of time that I'm in with them at first, um, but leave food, I sit and read to them, read my emails, talk on the phone, anything where they can hear my voice, but also I can passively interact with them so they don't have to worry about me entering their space directly. So I do that for an extended period of time while leaving food. And then I start by putting the leash over the dog's head and leaving it there. So I will usually use a hook because again, I can't get very close to the dog and um, they can't go very far because they are in a kennel. Um, and um, they will often, they have dog houses, so they'll often come out of their house and go around the kennel. Um, these dogs usually aren't interested in biting as long as I stay out of their way, because again, they are afraid of me, um, so they don't necessarily want to enter my space. So I just get them used to being on a leash, and I do that for a couple of months, and then I start slowly introducing that leash pressure and then go from there. So uh, lots of positive reinforcement as much as I can. Um, since my presence itself is aversive, I can't say that it's completely positive, but sure. I wanna make sure that the dog is completely comfortable and I work in five minute increments maximum um, multiple times a day and make sure not to move on until the dog is ready. So I use leaving the kennel as a reward, as well as interaction with other dogs. So most of my leash work initially will take place in that kennel and just going around the kennel, taking one step at a time. And then that kennel opens up into a bigger run and then going around that run, following the dog around the run. And then I introduce other dogs and then we transition to going outside. And I would imagine that working with an unpredictable dog like that, it's probably impossible to put a time frame on it and say, this is how long it takes. I would imagine it varies from dog to dog, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, if I can get a dog on leash, just on a leash, not necessarily out of the kennel in three months, that is very fast. So that would be more of the semi-feral, unsocialized category. A full-blown feral will take much longer than that. And that's looking at six months to a year plus. And, and I'm curious overall, and this is just a general shelter-related question, working with animals out there, I'm assuming that one of your goals when you rescue animals is to re able to rehome them and adopt them out again. Are there, is there a percentage or a number of animals that you get in that you say, this this is just an impossible case. We will never be able to adopt this animal out. Or do you make it your mission to try to to make headway with every single dog you bring in? Um, we do our very best to make sure that every single dog that we have in has the tools to be successful um, in whatever home that they may have. So in regards to a feral or semi-feral, um, usually that looks like um, people who are retired. 
um, who may not want a dog that is all over them. And um, we have had some success with that as well. Um, so, yeah. No, that makes sense. That's that's good. Um, I, I am fascinated by, and I think one of the things one of the one of the commenters on uh, in our chat window, uh, Pine Irwin said, "Many free roaming dogs enjoy a life that is probably more beneficial to being a dog than most own dogs do." Uh, mm -hmm. The power of total autonomy, and I, I, I liked that thought. It was my my impression as well, having lived for so long in my youth, my entire childhood, I lived in that kind of a community where dogs were free roaming all the time and they weren't unloved. They were very loved, but I think that's a foreign concept to those people who live in a city environment. And anytime you see a, an off leash dog roaming, you assume all automatically that it's a stray. Um, how, how do you go into the, the, the reservation environment and determine which dogs need to be rescued? Since clearly just because it's off leash doesn't mean it doesn't have a home. How, how do you make those decisions that this is a dog that we need to, to, to bring into the shelter and this is a dog we're going to leave alone because we feel based on what? How do you make those decisions? Absolutely. And I'll let Anna add to this after. I'm sure she has a lot to say on it as well. But essentially, it's all about communication. You want to make sure that you are asking people. Um, I always, whenever I'm questioning whether or not to take a dog, talk to gas station attendants, posting on community forums, and really making sure that that dog doesn't belong to anybody. And do you, do you have to wait to find that out? I mean, do you post something on social media and say, mm -hmm. anybody know whose dog this is? Or, or, or how do you do that communication? How do you get the word out? The easiest thing is if the dog, usually they are at a gas station or people um, will call us because there is a dog at the gas station. The attendants know how long those dogs have been there. So often they will tell us, hey, this dog has been here for uh, two, three months and is wrecking havoc we really want it gone. It doesn't belong to anybody. Please take it from us. Gotcha. Um, but they they know exactly what dogs are and are not supposed to be there. And often um, dogs will follow their people to and from work. So whenever there is an outside dog, they, they know who that is. Anna, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would also like to say that, um, especially with our medical case dogs, that we we know that they are not owned um, due to like their condition or perhaps sometimes like the location that they're found. Like a lot, something that's popular on the res is um, dumping dogs, um, which is really horrible, you know, abandoning your pet beside the road. Um, but if they're in the middle of nowhere, not near anyone's houses, and like this dog just showed up on the side of the road, it's pretty safe to say that it was dumped um, and that we can take it. And you can also take into account um, the dog's like physical health um, whenever you're making those decisions. That makes sense. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to take a quick break again. And then when we come back, I, want, I have some more questions for the two of you. And we'll also take more questions from our, our viewers. So don't hesitate to keep adding your questions to the, uh, to the chat window. But I thought I'd take a few minutes just to remind everybody about Clicker Expo. If you're an animal training professional or an enthusiast and you want, and then you're not going to want to miss uh, our Clicker Expo conferences. You can join us at Clicker Expo Live, which is our virtual conference later this month. It's just a few weeks away. Or Clicker Expo Portland, Oregon, which is our in-person conference. That's happening in April. They feature two completely different programs. So you can join us for both or join us for one, and you can learn more about both events at clickerexpo.clickertraining.com. Um, but I want to get back to talking with both Anna and Cameron. And I was thinking about, as you were talking about the training that you do there, Cameron, um, I thought to myself with the number of dogs that you guys take in, are you the only one doing training or do you have a team of volunteers, employees, others that are helping with that training? <laughs> How big is that team? Um, it is a team of one. So I occasionally have um, volunteers that show an interest um, that have been awesome here and then. 
Um, we have a volunteer by the name of Mark who is wonderful. And after I start getting the dogs comfortable, he has been an absolute asset in um, kind of taking over and kind of helping with that socialization. But full time, every day, that would just be me. Well, that's 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 a lot of work. And I, I'd imagine, um, I mean, on any given day, how many dogs do you end up interacting with it, from a training perspective? You know, if you're if you're saying, okay, I've got some training goals in mind for these dogs, are you going to get to two dogs, 10 dogs, 20 dogs? I mean, I'm, I just have no concept of how many you can handle in a typical day. Yeah, it actually, in this case, it does help that our dogs are co-housed. Um, uh, some of our dogs are co-housed. We have others that are by themselves. But I am in every single one of our runs uh, every day. Um, so, and I try to spend at least five minutes per run. So that's just with the average dog twice a day. So in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. And then I have my special cases that I will spend more time with and that's varying. So some of our younger juvies who just need social skills, I will take them on outings offsite that will range from anywhere from half an hour to an hour. And then our um, more severe cases, the feral and semi-feral dogs, they will get my attention five minutes throughout the day so that it's split up and not as stressful. Um, and then I have various things that I do throughout the day with the dogs, but I'm, I am outside all day in uh the in lovely utah weather elements <laughs> okay, well, i i i i know what that's like i'm familiar with the area um i'd love to invite juliana to, to come back on and join us again because uh again i keep seeing a variety of questions come in and i and i think uh we could go to some of those questions and that would be interesting for all of our 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 viewers to listen to some of the answers juliana do you have some questions queued up that you'd like to bring bring forward yeah, Samantha is asking, can you share the difference between a shy, semi-feral and truly feral dog? And how do you trap a feral dog that won't come to a human? So essentially with just a shy dog, uh, this is a dog that has exposure to people, but may just not have a complete socialization history, um, may be a little bit um, submissive when meeting new people or shy away from people, but they do have some socialization, some familiarity with people, um, the understanding that people mean food and, and may have even lived in homes, but may not want to come up to the average person that interacts with them. Um, a semi-feral would be a dog who has little, very little interaction with people. Their interaction may just be um, a person tossing food at them from a gas station or being around people um, casually, but never been in a home and never truly had interaction with people. Um, and then a true feral dog would be no interaction. These are dogs that are often in the middle of nowhere, um, they might be hunting, they might be scavenging, but they do not want to be around people at all. And those dogs, semi-feral and feral dogs will need to be trapped. Um, often they may not go in traps. Um, and we've had scenarios where um, feral dogs will be injured and um, drugs may have had to be used uh, by veterinarians in those cases. Um, but the best way is a trap um, if they go in. So a lot of patience in that and a lot of waiting. Um, but if the dog needs to be trapped, it is um, a very, very likely that they could be semi-feral or feral. But that doesn't mean um, it, often you can trap a dog and, and just see that the dog is shy, but you will not be able to get a semi-feral or feral dog without a trap. And, and it's interesting because I've been around some feral dogs, some very definitely what I would call wild dogs, that 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 it is amazing how clever they are in the sense that I think in an in an effort to be able to survive, to be able to find food and to be able to navigate in the world they live in, they become very suspicious. They become very aware of everything that's going on. And uh, it can be it can be a real challenge. Uh, I've, I've seen feral dogs like that kind of outwit the smartest of humans. And that's that, I don't know if that's been your experience, but it's certainly been Absolutely. mine. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so there are definitely those cases where you are sitting out with a trap for weeks on end and the dog doesn't go in and, and there isn't always something that can be done about that. So right. um, we, we do what we can. Absolutely. Juliana, what other questions do you have or do our guests have? I, I, I find this subject fascinating and I could ask, there's a lot of different directions we could go down. I thought I'd give you a chance to see where you'd like to take the conversation next. I think this is a great question that can open up some more conversation. Dylan asks uh, or says, I'm a huge fan of your work. Thank you so much for all you're doing to serve the people and non-human animals of these communities. Who are some of your favorite dogs you have met so far? Oh, yeah, that's great. Tell us some of the stories that I know you were, you were hoping to be able to share with us. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, the sound. <laughs> We're not able to hear you, Anna. Let's see if we can figure out, uh, we can turn your volume on. Weird. Let's see. Oh no. All right. Um, I do not see that you are, I don't know why we don't have you. Am I oh, good there now? You. You're yeah. on now. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, I was just going to say that I'll let Cam first because I know that she has some dogs in mind and then I also have some in mind. Okay. Sure. Um, Tell us some stories. Yeah. So the first one that comes to mind is uh, Miss Lamb Chop, who I am absolutely obsessed with her name. Um, but she was my first project dog when I came to Underdog a year ago. Um, and she had already been at the ranch for two years and was in a bigger run. So she was very avoidant of people, um, would not come near any of the staff. So the first thing that I did when I came here was um, put her in a smaller space. And then I started with that leash work, um, like we talked about. And she actually was just recently adopted um, from one of our transfer trips that we did. Um, and is in bed with her people now and is doing absolutely amazing. And we could not have asked for a better home or outcome for her, um, especially from where she came from. And That's great. yeah, and the second dog, uh, his name is Bodie, and he is actually still at the ranch. He came to the ranch with a broken leg, and he very clearly, um, I will put him in the semi-feral and socialized category because he wanted to be around people, but was terrified of them. And um, he was at the ranch for a year. He's actually just about to come up on his two year anniversary. And I had him at my house for a year um, and um, started working with him. And six months in, I was able to get a drag leash on him. And um, about two months ago, he finally, after a year at my house, was coming up to me for pet consistently. And he walks beautifully on a leash now. And he is perfectly social, perfectly adaptable. And that's why I would put him more in the unsocialized semi-feral category rather than the feral, because he wanted to be around people so badly. Um, and he is doing wonderfully now. Well, that's great. So you were able to, he, he was able to overcome that fear and now he's really comfortable. Right, is the plan to adopt him out? Yes, he is perfectly adoptable and available on our website. So he will hit his two-year anniversary in January, I think the end of this month. Well, those are those are both great stories. Anna, do you have uh, one or two of your own that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, so we've actually had some great success at the end of 2023. Two of my favorite dogs, who are also two of our longest time dogs, um, got adopted, Speedy and Blue both um, almost completely black dogs, pretty big dogs. Um, Speedy was with us from just about two weeks after I started at Underdog. Um, he, his intake date was May 24th, 2022. Um, and he got adopted on New Year's Eve on the 31st. Um, that's the dog that Cameron was saying that, you know, she traveled to Nevada so that these people could meet Speedy. Um, and he was an almost solid black pit bull mix. Um, absolutely perfect, wonderful boy. Um, I cried a lot when I found out that he got adopted. He deserved it <laughs> so much. Um, and then another dog that got adopted on the 30th was Blue. I called him Blueberry. Um, he was on our wait list, our intake wait list at eight weeks old. Um, and we had him for almost two years. So he was in underdog's care for almost his entire life. And just because, you know, he was.
was a little bit shy and he was almost solid black, it really was like stacking against him, um, you know, these things that make dogs less adoptable. Um, but yeah, he got adopted too by the most perfect like big family and I'm so happy for him. And those are two of my favorite dogs. I ended 2023 in the best way with <laughs> the two greatest adoptions we've had. <laughs> those are great. It's great to hear those kinds of success stories and nice to hear uh, the kind of work that you're doing. I thought I would clarify because we are live from the ranch and Cameron keeps talking about at the ranch. We're talking about two different Hi. ranches. You're, when you talk about uh, uh, the ranch, Cameron, you're referring to the facility there at uh, yes. uh, uh, in Moab, uh, yes, the underdog rescue facility. Not. Right. Yes. yes. So I just, just wanted Sorry. to make sure that listeners might not <laughs> might be confused that there's a ranch here in Washington where we teach classes about training and the ranch there at uh, the which is the rescue center that 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 both of you are representing today. So, uh Juliana, do you have another question for either one of our guests today? I'm curious what the future might hold for the rescue. Do are there any big plans? Is it kind of to keep things going the way that they are now? What are you hoping in for the future with your organization? Um, well, so in 2023, we did get a grand very own spay and neuter mobile. We had previously contracted um, other organizations to come in and we paid them and then we were the volunteers and it was a team of vets, of vets um, and we borrowed their equipment. But we actually got a grant and we got our very own spay and neuter mobile. So it's all ours, which is absolutely fantastic. And so we've been doing two day clinics in 2023. And in 2024, we're hoping we're hoping to expand to three day clinics, which would be really awesome. You know, we can service more animals that way. Um, and then we really are just trying to educate more. We really want to do more outreach. Um, also, in 2023, we opened a thrift store to help. Um, it's like a completely nonprofit thrift store where we take donations from the community and we turn that into funding for our mission and for our spay and neuter clinics and for our dogs. Um, and we're just hoping to see more of that. We want more growth in our clinics. We want more people there. We want to rescue even more dogs, spay and neuter even more dogs. Um, like the possibilities are limitless. We're just trying to go as hard at it as we can. That's, that's really great. It's nice, nice to hear that, that, that you've, that you you've got so many plans and that there are I mean there's clearly no shortage of dogs for 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 you to <laughs> to be working with so uh, yeah. that that's that's uh, that's great that you're able to do that kind of work. Um, any other questions from you, Juliana, or anything else that have come in from our viewers? Yeah, Samantha just asked a great question. What should a person be prepared for when adopting a res dog? Um, so essentially you are, we are taking dogs that have never been in homes. Um, so a lot of patience is required, um, and socialization into our normal lives, um, that they wouldn't necessarily be used to. Um, so making sure that they are, they have enough mental stimulation. Mental stimulation is often, as we know, um, more important, just as important, but often more important um, than physical stimulation. So making sure that these dogs are stimulated because they were free to make their own choices, their own schedules, and now they are adapting to our daily lives. So we need to make sure that they are able to have their needs met as best as we possibly can. Excellent. And I, I'm going to go ahead and give give uh, you or uh, Anna the opportunity to answer the second part of the question. And Samantha asked, how can people help support Underdog with all the incredible work that you're doing? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what people can do if they're trying to want to support your work? Um, there are lots of different ways that you can support Underdog. Um, not only can you become a donor, which is so amazing and fantastic, um, but you can tell your friends. You can follow us on our social media, on Instagram, at Underdog Rescue Moab. You can follow us on Facebook, at Underdog Rescue Moab. Um, you can tell your friends, because this situation in the Four Corners area will not be able to improve um, if more people aren't educated about it. The main thing, the main reason that this is a problem is because not enough people know about it. If more people knew, then we could really help these animals. We could really make a huge difference in their lives if we had, um, you know, more people behind us, more education, more resources. And that's probably the best way. 
Excellent. Thank you. That's that's really, really great. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to see if Juliana has any other questions that she wants to bring to the front. Uh, otherwise, we'll start to wrap it up soon. It looks like we've gotten to everybody's questions in the chat. Right. So thanks, everybody, for participating. I'm glad. And I'm really happy that the two of you could join us today. I, uh, I travel a lot and find myself in uh in your area uh quite often so uh cameron you maybe hear me knocking at your door to come visit with you and see what you're doing out there if that's okay absolutely. with you absolutely okay good good i have a lot of a lot of family i grew up in the new mexico area and uh, make my way through four corners all the time i'd love to come out and see some of the great work that you're doing and i really appreciate you sharing everything that you shared with us today i encourage people to support uh any shelter in your area, but certainly uh, these these programs like Underdog that are doing great work in the in the reservation community is 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 such a, 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 a real help. And so I'm so pleased that the two of you could be with us today. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and remind everybody that for us here at KPA, we think of this as Train Your Dog Month. January is Train Your Dog Month, and you can jumpstart your training uh, in the new year with up to 20% off all of our online courses, uh, training essentials, and streaming videos. And you can view all of the offers that we have at uh, KarenPryor.com. And uh, thank you both for being here. And Juliana, I was going to say I'll see you next month. Actually, I'll see you at the end of the month at Clicker Expo, won't I? So uh, she's off the screen right now, but I, I know she's she'll be looking forward to seeing everybody at Clicker Expo. Um, I want to thank you two for being here. Uh, we're going to wrap up the broadcast right now, and I want to remind everybody that next month, which will be the first Thursday in February, uh, we will have our guest will be a Lori Stevens, who is going to be returning as a guest, and she's going to be talking about taking care of older dogs. Uh, Lori does a lot of great great work with 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 exercise and health and she specializes often in working with aging and older dogs and we're going to be talking about that on our february 1st episode which i think is going to come up on us quick because it's the first day of the month and we want to remind all of you that if you have suggestions for who might be on the bro a future broadcast or if you have questions or if you have videos that you'd like to share with us when you go to our website, you can visit the ranch website and go there and we have a, an area where you can submit your suggestions and we welcome you to do that because we love hearing from all of our viewers. And finally, here's just a reminder of the offers that we put on the screen and that we talked about today from becoming a, a dog trainer to uh, coming to Clicker Expo or celebrating Train Your Dog Month. All of those are things that we hope you'll do. And we want to encourage you to support Underdog Rescue and Rehab. Uh, I think Anna and uh, Cameron did a great job of talking about all of the wonderful things that they're doing at that uh, at the ranch, at their rescue center there. Thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you on live from the ranch next month. Happy training. Bye-bye. <laughs>